right, so it looks like people are filtering in. So I want to welcome everyone here to today's environmental forum. Um, many of you are guests today, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about the environmental forum. My name is Katie Gerber. I'm a faculty member at Santa Rosa Junior College up here in lovely Sonoma County. Um, and the environmental forum is a course that students take that is part of the environmental studies major. Now, one of the things we do is we bring people to come in and give presentations about various environmental topics, and we do this every spring. And those presentations that we have, we like to open them up to the public so other people uh, from our college students, the college community, and others can actually come and enjoy them as well. And I appreciate all of those that you, you, of you that can be here today. Um, this presentation is co-sponsored by the Student Government Association Sustainability Committee, and I want to give the SGA and the Student Sustainability Committee, I um, want to thank them for their support. So the theme of this semester's environmental forum is on climate change. And a lot of us in Sonoma County are feeling the need to address climate change and learn more about what we can do and how we can get involved. And today I'm very excited to have Dr. Catherine Hayhoe with us. She is a climate scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She's a distinguished professor and co-chair of the Climate Center at Texas Tech University. She's also the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and a national science advisor on the board of Citizens Climate Lobby, a group that's gonna come speak to us uh, in the Environmental Forum in a couple of weeks. Um, there's a lot more that she does, a lot more advising and a lot more other things, but I'm gonna actually turn this over to Catherine Hayhoe and we'll hear more about what she has to say about talking climate. So thank you very much again for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to be with you all here today. So today we're talking about climate change. We're talking about why it matters and we're talking about how we as individuals can make a difference. And because I'm a scientist, I wanna begin at the very beginning. I wanna talk about why climate matters because so often we jump right away to, oh, climate is changing, we have to fix it. But we don't often think about how climate itself matters to us as humans. And it matters a lot. So often we get confused over what climate is and we confuse it with weather. We say, oh, there's a heat wave, that must be global warming. And then we see a cold wave and people say, oh, there's a cold wave, where is global warming now? What's happening is we are confusing weather with climate. Weather is like a single tree. It's what happens in a certain place at a certain day or week or year. And here's the thing, our brains are built to remember weather. Our brains are really good at remembering weather. We all have a weather story or two or three or four. We can talk about that time that we experienced that crazy flood or storm or heat wave or hurricane. So I'm gonna actually try to prove this by asking you a question. Now you have to answer this question with a word. I just want one word. If you have to use two words, put a dot between them. You'll see why when you start to answer, okay? So the most memorable weather event that I've lived through was what? All right, so we have a ton of different answers here, right? We've got fire, flood, tornado, lightning, storms, rainfall, wind, hurricanes, blizzards, straight line winds. Everybody had no problem, despite what the software said, everybody had no problem finding an extreme event, right? But what's climate? Climate is the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. Climate is like a forest. And here's the thing, our brains are not built to remember climate. Why not? Because to remember climate, you would have to be able to add up the temperature on every single day of the year for at least 20 to 30 years and fit a trend line through it. And I'm not gonna ask you if you've done that for the place where you live, because I don't think anybody has done that. You need a computer to do it. You can't even do it in your head. So climate is something that's profoundly non-intuitive for us, yet climate provides the entire basis for our society. Our entire society is built on the assumption that you can have hot and cold and wet and dry, but that the highs and lows we've seen in the past and the long-term average conditions are reliable predictors of what it's gonna be like in the future. What aspects of human society are built on these assumptions? Our building codes, 
what type of crops we grow, where and when and how, the energy demand that we plan for, the 100 year flood zones, the whether we have snow plows or not, our energy and our water planning, even the clothes in your closet are based on the average climate of where you live, right? You have very different clothes in your closet if you live in Anchorage versus Santa Rosa versus Miami, Florida. Here's the thing though, planning for the future based on the past, based on the conditions we've had in the past, it works as well as driving down the road, looking in the rear view mirror works. And you might say, well, that doesn't work. Well, it actually does work if you're on one of the dead straight roads like we have out West, right? If, if you're on a dead straight road, if climate is not changing significantly, you can drive down that road looking in your rear view mirror. But what happens if there's a curve in the road? When the road is straight, when climate isn't changing, we're okay. But if there's a curve in the road, when climate is changing, we can't rely only on the past anymore. Climate change matters because it is a curve in our road. We are heading to places we have not been before. So our old way of planning based on the 100 year flood zone, the average temperature, the average air conditioning and heating demand, the average water, all of those averages are based on what? On the past. We have to look to the future and the future is going to be different. So first of all, what we see is we see our long term average changing. We see that temperatures are increasing. We see that long-term rainfall patterns are changing. We see that ice sheets are melting. We see that sea levels rising. So how do long-term trends affect California? Well, I'll just give you one example of many. And one example is, is that these long-term trends, again, affect our future average conditions, like, for example, sea level. So here is where we have very large cities in North America located within just a few feet of sea level. And you can see that many of those are over in California. What's happening as sea level rises? Well, we see an increase in what they call sunny day flooding or high tide flooding. So you don't even have a storm, you just have a high tide and it's flooding. In Miami, they're already raising the level of the streets by two feet. In Florida, Zillow estimates you're gonna lose 15% of your coastal home value on average due to sea level rise. In California, there's many cities that are already at risk from climate change from sea level rise too. We know that sea level is rising now twice as fast as it was just 25 years ago. And we know that in some areas like where I am in Texas, land is actually sinking at the same time. So as the land sinks and sea level rises, the relative rate of sea level rise is going up even faster. This is a really helpful tool from uh, an organization called Climate Central. They have what they call a coastal risk screening tool. And this is showing in 30 years, so 30 years is not that far away, it's showing in 30 years the area of the Bay Area that is likely to be permanently inundated, permanently inundated, not just sunny day flooding, by the impacts of rising sea level. Well, that's not all that's happening. We see that the long-term average is changing, but we also see that the variability is changing. And that's where we see a lot of the even bigger impacts. We care about a changing climate, not just because the averages are changing, we care about it because it is taking the risks we already face today, all of the extreme weather and climate risks that already exist, and it's making a lot of them worse. So I know what I'm talking about because I live in Texas. And if you look at this map, this is a map from the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that shows the number of weather and climate disasters that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage from 1980 to 2020. And you can see that Texas is number one. Why? Well, one of the big reasons is because we get everything in Texas that you can imagine. In Texas, we get ice storms and blizzards and snow. We also get floods and droughts. We get dust storms so big they're called haboobs. We actually had one just two weeks ago. We get hurricanes. We get pretty much every type of extreme event you can imagine. But California is not far behind. California has um, many extreme events as well. Like what? Well, 
we know obviously that drought, that wildfire, that extreme heat are all things that happen in California too. They happen naturally because of where California is located and because of what its ecosystems look like. There's always been drought in California. There's always been heat waves. There's always been wildfires, right? But what's happening as climate changes is it's sort of as if it's sneaking in and it's loading the weather dice against us. It's as if we have a pair of weather dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six. A double six is a, you know, an atmospheric river hitting California or a wildfire or a drought or extreme heat. We always have a chance naturally of rolling a double six. But as climate changes, it's sort of as if it's sneaking in decade by decade, it's taking another number and then another number and turning them into sixes and then another number turning it into a seven. And all of a sudden we're like, hey, the city of Houston, for example, in Texas, just had three 500 year flood events in three years. How is that possible? It's possible because climate change is loading the dice against us. If our 500 year events are based on the past, then they're not 500 year flood events anymore, are they? That's why climate change is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. It takes the problems we already have and it makes them worse. The question is not, did climate change cause something? Climate change doesn't typically cause an event to happen. The question is, did climate change make it worse? And often the answer is yes. So let's look at some California specific examples. First of all, we see that summer heat is increasing. Summer temperatures have already warmed by as much as 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit since the 1970s. And you can see that inland is warming more than along the coast. What's happening? Well, it affects us. We're seeing all kinds of headlines these days about record breaking heat waves. That man with the ice on his head there, um, Last year, we also know that in Siberia, they had a heat wave that was virtually impossible without the impacts of climate change. We know that heat waves don't just affect our health and our heat, they affect our air quality, they affect um, our water, they affect our droughts. And a recent study, for example, has shown that we are seeing changes not just in our average temperature in the summer, but we're actually seeing changes in heat waves in California. So the number of heat waves in California per year has gone from an average of about four a year in the 1960s up to almost 10 a year now. That's twice, more than twice as many heat waves, two and a half times as many heat waves. We see that heat waves used to last about four days. Now they're lasting six days. And we see that the intensity of the heat wave is also increasing. So they are more frequent, they are longer, and they're worse too. This is a concrete way that climate change is loading the dice against us in California. What else is happening in California? Well, we know that it isn't only about heat, it's about humidity too, because we humans, our body respond to the heat index. And we see that the heat index is going up and we're gonna be seeing more and more extreme heat danger days for humans working outside. This just shows LA, I'm sorry I didn't have Santa Rosa here. This shows LA, but we're gonna see more extreme heat days that are dangerous for people to be working or jogging or exercising outside. We know that droughts are a normal part of life in California but we know that droughts have tremendous impacts on California. And we know that the hotter it is, the stronger and the longer the drought. In fact, study has, researchers have found that hot and dry weather is getting more frequent. So not just droughts, but hot droughts. And it turns out that the hotter it is, the more it reinforces the weather patterns that sit over California during drought. There's this thing called the ridiculously resilient ridge that sits over California during droughts. And that ridge gets stronger and stronger the hotter it is. So there's a relationship between heat and drought too. Well, of course, that's not all. And you're probably wondering when she gonna get to this one. What about wildfires? Wildfires are definitely part of the ecosystem in California, but orange apocalyptic skies like this are not. 
So I want to go back to polyv.com. Let's hope it's functioning well now. And I want to ask you a question. This is a simple yes and no question. Have you had to breathe wildfire smoke? Yes or no? So yes, 94% of you say yes, you've had to breathe wildfire smoke. Exactly. Okay. So now let me ask you another question. Oh, a few more. Okay. So 92% have had to breathe the smoke. Now the next question is, have you had to evacuate because of wildfire? How many people have actually had to evacuate because of wildfire? All right. It looks like about 70% have had to evacuate and 27% haven't. Okay. Yes. Oh, Oh, still sticking about 70, 30. Okay, so not over 90 have had to breathe it. Over 70% have had to evacuate. And then next question here, just a second. Um, have you or has a family member, a close friend lost your home to wildfires? And I would say that my cousins, Ted and Denise, live in Santa Rosa. They have lost their home to wildfire and they have had to evacuate due to climate or to do wildfire too. So if I were answering these questions, you know, I would have said yes and yes to the previous question too. Okay, so, oh my gosh, 60%, 60% of people have either lost their home or know, have family or a close friend who have lost their home. That is just, I mean, devastating. So how does this connect to climate change? Well, what's happening is we're seeing fires get bigger and bigger. I don't know if you remember, but the Thomas wildfire, which was like, you know, over three years ago, it was the largest on record. But then what happened was the ranch fire broke that record six months or eight months later. And then the campfire broke that record. And then the records keep getting smashed again and again and again. I don't know if you've seen this figure from Cal Fire, but this shows the area burned by the 20 largest wildfires in California's history since they started tracking the area in 1932. So in 1932, which was 90 years ago, they started tracking the area burned by wildfires. The first three pie pieces there are wildfires that happened before 2000. So three of the biggest wildfires happened before 2000. Then the blue is all the ones that happened from 2000 to 2019. And then what's the red? The red is 2020 alone. What's the connection to climate change? Well, in California, as you probably know, the vast majority of wildfires in California are accidental human ignition. Some are started by lightning. It's estimated that 7% are the result of deliberate arson, an intent to start a fire, but most of them are accidental, like what? Like someone dumping a load of burning trash into the dry brush. Someone leaving an old appliance plugged in the shed or the garage and it shorts out and burns down the garage and starts a fire. Um, power lines sparking or fireworks at a gender reveal party. These are all real life examples of what started some of the biggest wildfires on this figure. Now, climate change does not, um, you know, climate change does not uh, force people to uh, tell people where to dump their, their, their trash or whether, whether to let off fireworks or not. That's not climate change. So where does climate change come in? Climate change comes in like this. Imagine that you have a pile of green, fresh, fairly wet wood and you accidentally drop a match into it or even you drop the match on purpose. What happens? Not much. Imagine you have a pile of bone dry kindling and you drop a match into that, what happens? It just lights on fire, you have a conflagration. That's the difference between with or without climate change. Climate change dries out the vegetation in the soil so that when a wildfire starts, it burns greater area, it's hotter, it spreads faster, and it's much more damaging. From the 1980s to 2015, so this is leaving out the last five years, just up to 2015, this is from the National Climate Assessment, we see that with, without climate change, wildfires would have burned about 11 million acres across the whole US, but with climate change, what happened? With climate change loading the dice against us, wildfires burned over double the area. See what I mean? Climate change is a threat multiplier. And this is not only happening in California, as you know, in 2019, Alaska had its most expensive wildfire season on record. 
In uh, 2016, Canada had the worst insured disaster in history and it was a wildfire. Do you remember back in January last year, pre-COVID? I know it kind of feels like it was like 50 years ago at this point, but last January, pre-COVID, do you remember what the headlines were about? They were about the Australian brush fires. Climate change is loading the dice against us in many different ways. Storms, hurricanes, heat, heavy rain, also wildfire. And we're seeing this in the place where we live. The Prime Minister of Dominica, one of the small islands in the Caribbean that was devastated by the hurricane season in 2017, climate change making hurricanes not more frequent, but bigger and stronger and much more damaging. When he spoke to the United Nations, he said something that I think really resonated. He said this, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have just lived. How could you say it's not real when we've actually lived through it? It destroyed our homes. It devastated the place where we live. We saw it with our own eyes. So this raises an important question. Why aren't we treating this thing like an alarm? Why aren't we treating this thing like a five alarm fire, right? Why aren't we reacting in the right way? Well, to look at the answer to this question, I do have an answer to this question. We have to turn not to scientific data about temperatures or rainfall or drought or wildfires. We have to turn to data about people, about what people are thinking and why. And when we do that, this is what we see. I'm gonna show you a series of maps and what you're looking at is you're looking at every county in the US and they ask the people in the county a question. And if people said yes, if more than 50% of people said yes, the county's an orange color. If more than 50% of people said no, it's a blue color. And the darker orange it is, the more people said yes, the darker blue, the more people said no. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and highlighted Sonoma County here. So it's actually, you can see the specific numbers for Sonoma, uh, Sonoma County, as well as you can see the numbers for the whole US. So when you say, do you think global warming is happening? Most people say, yes, it's happening. Okay. Then you say, will it harm plants and animals? People say, yeah, I think it will harm plants and animals. Do you think it will harm future generations? I know this looks like the same map, but it's actually a different map. People say, yes, I think it's real. It will harm plants and animals. It will harm future generations. And then you say, do you think it will harm people in developing countries? So people who live far away. Uh, we're down a little bit, 65% instead of 70%. You're seeing lighter orange, a little bit of blue but still mostly orange. Do you think global warming will harm people in, what are we doing here? We're getting closer and closer and closer, right? Do you think it will harm plants and animals, people in the future, people in developing countries, people in the United States? Now we're down to 61%. And then they ask this question, do you think it will harm you? Oh my goodness. The answer is no, 43% think it will harm them. And even in Sonoma County, where 92% of you have breathed uh, smoke from wildfires, where 70% um, of people have had to evacuate, where 60% of people have either lost their home or they know somebody who's lost their home, somehow only 48% of people think climate change will affect them. This is the biggest problem that we have. We haven't connected the dots. It is right here in front of us, like that prime minister from that Caribbean island said, we have seen it with our own eyes, we have lived through it, yet we haven't understood how it's connected to climate change. And this is something that social scientists call psychological distance. Let me explain what it is. It's not that complicated when you think about it. Psychological distance is thinking that something is far away from us and it can be far away from us in time it matters to the future, but not now. It could be far away from us in space. It matters to people who live over there, but not people who live here. It can be far away from us in terms of being sort of abstract, like, oh, global average temperature is going up instead of wildfires in California are burning two to three times the area. You know, the big difference between those two statements. And we also see it as far away in terms of its relevance to us. We are like, okay, it matters to people who care about the polar bears, right? But if I'm not a polar bear, why does it matter? Well, it matters because after the polar bear, guess who's next? Us. In fact, I love this little picture. 
We are the ones on the metaphorical iceberg. We are the ones who are most at risk. Why? Because our entire civilization, remember that, our building codes, our energy and water plans, our agriculture, our entire civilization is built on the assumption of a stable climate. And today, climate is no longer stable. Why do we care about climate change? We care about climate change, yes, because of the polar bear, and yes, because of species, yes, because of plants and animals, yes, because of the future. But we also care about it because of things that matter to us here and now. We care about it because it literally affects the quality of the water we drink, the availability and the quality and the cost of the food we eat. It affects the safety of our homes. It affects our jobs and the economy. It affects our health, breathing in all that smoke from wildfire. We care about climate change because it affects everything that we already care about. So here's a chance to tell me another question here. Give me a word, and again, one word. And we shouldn't see all the same words here. We should see different words here. Exactly. I care about it because it affects everything. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty right. It affects kids. It affects my life. Poll everywhere is being funky again, so let me restart it here. I'm sorry it's being so picky on us. I care about climate change because it affects everything I already care about, right? It affects every other aspect of our lives here on this planet. Exactly. It affects our family, our kids. It affects animals, the planet, our community. It affects people and ecosystems. It affects our mental health too. It affects pretty much everything. And so here's the connection. Often we think that to care about climate change, we have to be a certain type of person, right? But what type of person cares about the future? Pretty much every type of person cares about the future. What type of person cares about their family? Most people care about their family. What type of person cares about their community? Most people care about their community, right? What type of people care about their quality of life? Most people care about their quality of life. What type of people care about their, their home? Just about everybody cares about their home. So you see where I'm going with this? You don't have to be a certain type of person to care about climate change. Who we already are is the perfect person to care because climate change affects everything we already care about. Isn't that revolutionary? Let me just say that again. We are already the perfect person to care because climate change affects everything we already care about. We don't have to try to force people to care for the reasons we do. Each of us has a reason. It might be our kids. It might be our nieces and nephews. It might be our grandchildren. It might be ourselves. It might be animals. It might be our neighbors. We all have reasons to care already. And so it isn't that we don't care about climate change. We do. We just haven't connected the dots. That's what's so important is to help people understand how what they already care about is directly affected by climate change already today. So here's the last question. And at the end, I'm gonna be taking your questions. So if you have questions, don't worry, save them up. We will be taking your questions. But before we get there, I wanna answer this question and ask you one more question too. And my question is, okay, fine. Well, what am I supposed to do about this thing? It's this big global problem and I can't stop a wildfire. I mean, I could certainly not let off fireworks in a drought, but how am I supposed to deal with any of this? Well, here's the interesting thing. These maps actually hold the answer to that question. So we left off here. This is the map I was showing you before. In Sonoma County, 48% of people think that global warming will affect them personally and 43% around the whole country think that. This is not the darkest blue map. There's one more, ready? The darkest blue map is this one. Do you ever talk about it? You know what, across the whole US, only 35% of people, that's about a third of people, ever hear somebody else talk about it, let alone talk about it themselves, even occasionally. And in Sonoma County, it's only 46%, even occasionally. So here's the connection. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever want to do anything to fix it, right? It all begins with talking about it. Why don't we talk about it? We don't talk about it because we don't think it matters to us and we don't think there's anything positive we can do to fix it. That's why we don't talk about it. So when we do talk about it, often we take an approach also that doesn't work. 
Let me show you what doesn't work. So climate changes and we get worried. Obviously, if we're looking at what's happening, how can we not be worried? So then we think to ourselves, I'm worried because of all the bad things that I see happening. And believe me, I'm worried because I have all the bad things I see happening and I'm a scientist. So what we say, think is we see if somebody else doesn't look worried or act worried, or if they're not saying they're worried, or if they're saying that they're not worried, we're like, okay, we just need to round up all the scary facts and we need to dump them on them. If we just dumped more scary facts on them, they would realize that this is a big deal. But here's the problem. Our human psychology doesn't work like that. When somebody comes up to us and dumps scary facts on us about something that we really don't want to know about, because probably deep down we're already scared about it, we're just sort of in denial about it, we pull the blanket up over our head. We just reject it even more. And this is basic neuroscience. This is not related to climate change. This is just what we do with anything like this. So inaction results. There's a neuroscientist, her name is Tally Sherratt. She wrote a great book called The Influential Mind, and she also has a good TED Talk too. And in her book, The Influential Mind, she talks about how fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, and to give up rather than take action. So if we try to talk about climate change with people, but our goal is just to induce fear and anxiety in people, that's not actually going to fix the problem. What do we need to talk about? Rather than dumping scary data on people, we have to talk about why and how climate change matters to us. And that's not good news, but it's bringing it close and being personal. We're not talking about polar bears in the Arctic. We're talking about what's happening in California. We've got sea level rise, we've got heat, we've got drought, we've got wildfires, and it's happening here and now. It's not happening in the future. It's not happening in other countries. It's not happening to plants and animals or people we don't know. It's happening right here. And we also have to talk about all the positive things we can do to fix it. So climate changes and we get worried, but here's where we break the vicious cycle, ready? Rather than dumping more scary data on people, instead, what we do is talk about how it affects us here and now, and what we can do to fix it. And what this does is this empowers people because they understand, oh, who I am is the perfect person to care. I already have every reason I need to care. I don't have to turn into a tree hugger if I don't want to. I already care about climate change because it affects things like my family and the air that my kids breathe and the home that we live in. And there's positive things that we can do to fix it. So what happens is action results. And as neuroscience tells us, um, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So, and I love this because she's not talking about climate change here at all, but at the same time, it has everything to do with climate change, right? She says, so reframe what you're talking about. So the information you provide induces what? Hope, not dread. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing to do is to begin a conversation with something we agree on rather than something we disagree on. Too often conversations about climate change begin with what we disagree on, but we have to begin with what we agree on. Do we agree on the place where we live or the fact that we're part of a family or we have a shared faith? We enjoy doing a similar activity. We both have military experience. We both come from ag families. What kind of things can we bond over? So when I talk to people, I sort of do a mental inventory of who I am. So I am a scientist, so I definitely connect with people over being a scientist, obviously. I live in Texas, so I connect with people over, you know, living in Texas. I really enjoy outdoor activities in the snow. I love skiing. I love skating. I love snowshoeing. I love hiking in winter. I love winter camping even. I love the snow, so I connect with people over that. I'm a mom, so I connect with people over having kids and about caring about my kids. And I'm a Christian, so I connect with people over shared faith. So this is my last question to you. And I want you to think very carefully about this. If you could, and what, give me, you have to give me one word. I know I kind of cheated. I had like five or six there, but give me one word. I care about climate change because I am a what? We shouldn't see all the same answer here. We should see a ton of different answers because we're all different people and we all care about different things. And this is exactly what we're seeing, right? 
we got some scientists here. That's nice to see. I'm a scientist too, obviously, and I'm a mom too, but we've got students. We've got humans. Yeah, I think we're all humans, right? We've got an ant. We've got a cyclist, an artist, a teacher, a friend, a gardener, um, a hiker, a, a social justice warrior. Love that too. Dancer, traveler, nature lover, sportsman, brother. Exactly. So who we are, again, is the perfect person to care because of who we are, not in spite of it. So you might look at this list and you might, you might be like, well, I don't identify with that. And that's totally fine. You don't have to. Somebody can care about climate change for a totally different reason than you do. So whoever you are, you are on this list. Do you see that? So somebody does not have to be an environmentalist to care about climate change, though it certainly helps. You do not have to be a scientist to care about climate change, though it certainly helps. Every single one of us is a human, and that's why we care. So I talked about how we can talk about why climate change matters to us, but I don't want to end yet without talking about what we can do to fix it because there's so many good things to share there. And that's what gives us hope. The recognition that climate change is not a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of the hill with only a few hands trying to roll it up to the top of the hill. We'll never get it there. No, when we talk about solutions, we share the vision that climate change is a big boulder that's already sitting at the top of the hill. And there's thousands and even millions of hands pushing that boulder down the hill and it's rolling down the hill in the right direction. It just isn't going fast enough. Like what? Well, I love talking about solutions in Texas. Did you know that Texas has entire towns powered by green energy? Texas has the first carbon neutral airport in North America. Texas has the biggest army base in North America. That's probably no surprise. But did you know that it's powered 45% by clean energy? Those are great stories to share with people. What about in California? Well, in California, you've got tons of great stories you can share too. You can talk about how there's a California Climate Action Corps you can talk about how um, two years ago, solar energy plus storage hit a record low price in California, below the cheapest it's ever been. And it's gone on to get even cheaper. I love talking about how big companies like Apple and Microsoft and Walmart are moving forward on climate solutions. I like talking about what faith communities are doing what Catholic communities are doing, what evangelical communities are doing, what Jewish communities are doing. There's so much happening in faith communities that can surprise people and give us hope. I like talking about what's happening around the world, how clean energy is revolutionizing some of the poorest places on the planet, how during COVID last year, clean energy was so successful that over 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy. And if you're looking for any more talking points and you haven't checked out Project Drawdown yet, please do. In fact, I'm going to put a link in the chat there so you can get it. Project Drawdown has all kinds of great resources. Drawdown.org, there we go. And on all, whoops, on all kinds of climate solutions. And so if you just read any of these little short articles, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I have great news to share with people about climate solutions of all kinds. Here's the bottom line though. It turns out that the social science is clear. The number one best person to have this conversation is you, not me, but you. What do I mean by that? Friends and family are the most effective and trusted people to have these conversations. Scientists are number two and friends and family are number one. So that's why when I was asked to do a TED Talk back two years ago, I said, I want to do a TED Talk on the most important thing that any one person can do about climate change. And you know what that is? It is talking about it. Because if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever do anything about it? So using our voice to advocate for change in our family, in our school, in our place of work, in our place of worship, in our community, in our whatever group or social organization or area we're part of, we, each of us has a sphere of influence where we can talk to people about why this matters and about what we all working together can do to help fix it. Thank you. Whoops. 
Now, before I take your questions, I want to mention just one more thing, and that is that I've written a brand new book, and it's coming out in September, but you can already order it now if you're interested. And in this book, I talk a lot more about that whole idea of hope, where it comes from, how we as individuals can make a difference. So if you guys are interested, what you just heard was not my TED Talk. That was not my TED Talk. <laughs> so my TED Talk talks a lot more specifically about how to actually have these conversations. And then, like I said, my book's coming out in September, but you can already order it if you're interested. I'm very excited about it. So you can go ahead and click there as well. All right, it looks like we've got a bunch of questions and they're having a nice lot of upvotes too. So Katie, you wanna go ahead and pick one to start? Okay, so I'm just gonna go with some that are have maybe uh, more questions to them. One of them that has a lot of questions right now, or a lot of up arrows is, what are the best careers degrees to go in to help fight climate change? What will make the biggest impact? Ooh, I love this question. Um, in fact, this is one of my favorite questions. And my answer is going to kind of surprise you. My answer is, we need everybody. And you are particularly good at and you enjoy something that is different from almost anybody else on the planet. Everybody has their own abilities, their own talents, their own gifts, their own interests, and we need everyone. So when people say, what should I major? And I say, you should major in something that you enjoy and you're good at, and then you should use it to help fight climate change. Let me give you an example. I have colleagues and collaborators. I've had students. I have people who I work with who have degrees in, just to give you an example, public relations, technical writing marketing and advertising, ecology, political science, civil engineering, transportation engineering, water management, city planning, um, education, psychology, art, philosophy. <laughs> you kind of get the picture. I don't owe oh, medicine and law and business and agriculture. Um, I literally have worked with people who have skills in almost every area that you can possibly imagine. And every single one of them has had something unique and something valuable to contribute. So do what brings you joy, do what you're good at, and do something that can make a difference. And I actually want to share a really cute little diagram with you. Um, one of my colleagues, her name is Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She is an ocean scientist and she helps to put together this great book called All We Can Save, uh, which is a compendium of 60 uh, women's voices on climate change. And she made this great little figure that I think answers your question very succinctly. And I'm gonna share it with you right here from her Instagram account. And it is this. What you should do is a function of three things. It is a function of what you are good at, your special skills, your resources, your magic, so to speak. What is the work that needs to be done, working on climate and working on justice solutions? And then, I love the top one, what brings you joy, what gets you up in the morning? Because neglecting your joy will lead to burnout. So I'm going to put this link in the chat here if you are interested in following her on Instagram. She's fantastic. And thank you so much for that great question. Okay. And we have a few more that are tied for top votes, but what's the best way to engage a climate change denier? Oh, <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing. And I'm glad I'm going to be able to share my screen with you again. Um, it turns out that when it comes to climate change, we fall into six groups, not just one. We fall into, just a second here, let me share this with you. We fall into um, a, a range where 26% of us are alarmed and 29% are concerned. 19% are cautious. We might leave with our doubts, but we can engage in conversation about this. Only 8% of us are dismissive, only 8%. Now, don't get me wrong, dismissive people are the loudest voices in the room. We all have an uncle, I have an uncle. You may have a family member, a cousin, a neighbor, a you know, call your college roommate, you know somebody who's dismissive. Everybody knows a dismissive person because they can't leave climate change alone and they always want to argue. Well, you know what? I don't think there's any trick to talking with a dismissive person because I literally think that not even an angel from God could change their mind. And if an angel from God couldn't, who am I to think that I could? In fact, I have, um, I have a Twitter thread where I lay out my logic and I'll put the Twitter um, thread in here if you wanna click on it to read later. But the logic is if somebody's dismissive, I just say, you know what, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. But the good news is 92% of people are not dismissive. 
And so for them to kind of get to a different question on this list, what's the best place to start a conversation? With something that they would agree with you on, not something they would disagree with you on. Watch my TED Talk for more examples. And I love to start a conversation with an interesting, positive fact. Like, did you know that 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy? Isn't that amazing? Or did you know that, you know, California set the record for the cheapest solar energy with storage because the sun doesn't shine at night? <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, really? That's amazing. So look for hopeful information and use it to start conversations. And you might see your conversations going in a very different direction than when we started with, um, you know, doom and gloom or, you know, bad news that just makes us depressed. Even if we care about it, it just makes us sad and depressed. Okay. Um you might have already kind of answered this in your talk, but what is the most important thing one individual person can do to combat, to combat climate change? That is the title of my TED talk. <laughs> the most important thing we can do is talk about it because what we have to do to get a little bit more sciencey about this is we have to change our social norms. We have this idea that it is absolutely normal to dig up and burn massive amounts of fossil fuels to power our society. And it's totally normal that 9 million people die from the resulting air pollution every year. Somehow that seems normal to us. And we have to change that. How did people change slavery? How did they change civil rights? How did they get votes for women? How did people stop smoking? It was a combination of science, values, and people talking about it changing social norms. And so don't get me wrong, I have changed my light bulbs, I have solar panels, I drive a plug-in car, I've reduced my food waste, I hang up my clothes to dry, I only get free range meat. Don't get me wrong, I do those things. But when I do them, I also talk about them because I know the most important thing I can do is talk about what I'm doing, what the state where I live in is doing, what different universities are doing, what different churches and places of worship are doing, what different countries are doing. Talking about it is the single most important thing that we as individuals can do to, uh, to ensure social change happens. Because what happens is social change starts off with individuals. And then what happens is we sort of coalesce into groups. How? By talking and by realizing that we care about the same things. And then our groups sort of start to coalesce into bigger groups. And then that is what changes society. So please don't think that I'm saying that this is like the easy thing to do. It's not easy. It's a lot easier to, you know, use a shampoo bar instead of plastic in your bathroom than it is to talk to somebody about climate change. But this is truly how we can affect change. And my TED talk has a lot more details on how you can have those conversations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple more, if you're up for it. One yes. is, how do we get Western scientists to collaborate more with indigenous cultural practices and leadership? Um, well, that's a great question because um, I'm actually very involved in that because I'm part of the Department of Interior's Climate Adaptation Science Centers. So we have several tribal nations who are full partners with us in this work. And my experience has been that one of the biggest things that's lacking is just awareness. A lot of people are not aware of indigenous knowledge, of indigenous experience. Uh, and so what I try to do is I try to as you, you won't be surprised, I try to talk about it and promote it as much as I can. So for example, in our Climate Science Center here at Texas Tech, we have speakers every month and we had a wonderful speaker, April Taylor, who talked about, she's a tribal member and she talked about the impact of climate change on indigenous practices and culture here in the US. Um, I have, we, we went through and we recommended all kinds of books for people to read. In our next series coming up next year, we have another um, Native American speaker specifically talking about climate adaptation and what we can learn from indigenous knowledge. So I really think that there's often just a complete lack of awareness of the importance of this. And I really hope that the appointment of Deb Hagland to head the Department of Interior will actually help to raise awareness of how important the indigenous voice is. And I'm gonna go ahead and find that webinar I was talking about with April Taylor and put it in the chat here if anybody's interested and watching that next because I just loved hearing from her and I think you would too. First of all, what was your aha moment with respect to climate communication? Um, that's a great question. I love that. Um, I think my aha moment was when um, I, one of the first times that I was speaking to a group of people here in Texas when they asked me to come talk to them about climate change and I came and I talked about science, 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 as scientists do. And at the end, you know, I was explaining the science pretty clearly. And so at the end, people, you know, people were saying, okay, well, I, I understand what you're saying. But then all the questions were, but why should I care? And I realized that what I've been doing is I've been assuming 
I care because I'm a scientist. And so all of you should care for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And that was the way I'd been implicitly communicating with people. But of course, the reality is, like I talked about, we all have different reasons to care about climate change. And I hadn't explained any of those different reasons at all. I had just assumed everybody would care for the same reason I did. And so getting those questions, I feel like when people ask you questions, that's often sort of the most helpful thing to show you what you haven't said. That was a huge aha moment where I realized, oh my gosh, I haven't even, like, I need to get to know what people already care about and then show them how they already care about climate change. Um, and so sort of a counterpoint to that is the story that I tell in my TED talk where I went to a local Rotary Club a couple of years later and I walk in and they have a four-way test printed on a big banner and that's what Rotarians, you know, used to make their decisions. And the four-way test was, is it the truth? Um, is it fair? Is it beneficial to all? And I looked, I was like, this is climate change. So I talk about in the TED talk, so I won't tell the story in too much detail, but I reorganized my whole talk super quickly into the four-way test. And I gave the four-way test to a group of Rotarians on climate change. And at the very end, this one man, a local bank owner came up to me and I'll never forget, hit the most bemused look on his face, sort of like he didn't know what hit him. He's like, I never thought too much of this whole global warming thing, which is the polite Texan way of saying, I thought it was a load of crap. <laughs> but he said, but it passed the four-way test. Like, what can I do? <laughs> Clearly, I'm a Rotarian. It passed the four-way test, so I care about climate change. And I just felt like that was where I sort of came full circle from, you know, ignorantly assuming that everybody had to care because of the reason I did to realizing that, no, everybody already cares. We just haven't connected the dots. Hmm. Yeah, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And after engaging in a conversation, how do we encourage action? So in terms of action, the best thing to do is to talk about something. So for example, you could say, you know, hey, I just did this, would you like to? Or, hey, I went to a citizens climate lobby meeting, you wanna come with me to the next one? Or you could talk about um, how your, your city or your state is thinking about doing something. You said, you know, it's super e easy to send an email to our elected representative at the city level or the county level or the state level, do you wanna do it? Here's how you do it. So just say, hey, here's something I did, do you wanna do it with me? And that takes away a lot of the, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do? It, it gives you something simple to do. And the more you do, the more you're like, yeah, this isn't so bad, we can do this. And I'm just, this is a great segue for me to just put in a plug right there for um, Climate Action Night, which is an event that is hosted through SRJC and also through some of the local area um, high schools where students are actually presenting about upcoming um, pieces of legislation about climate that are related mm -hmm. to climate. Um, and that getting people involved, getting them to write letters and postcards is a big part of that. I'll share That's that fantastic. Okay, oh, you, yeah. Is there a link you could put in the chat there so people could... I can. Yes, I can look that up that. really quickly. I will. Um, that would be great. great idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm going to say is I know we have a few more questions we didn't get to, but please do check out all of the resources that I've been putting in the chat here. And if you have any more questions, I just put my website there last. And then, of course, we've got the link there to Climate Action Night. Don't forget that. And on my website, I have a lot of frequently asked questions and answers to frequently asked questions. So go ahead and go to my website. There's frequently asked questions there. And yes, this was recorded. So it was recorded. You will be able to view it again. You will be able to share. Uh, but thank you so much for your fantastic questions. They were so good. And I just really enjoyed speaking with you. All right. And I just want to thank you so much, Catherine Hayho, for coming and being willing. And thank you for everyone for attending. And now, uh, thank you. <laughs>